Good evening, everyone, and welcome to Social Flight Live. I'm Jeff Simon. We have a great show for you this evening. Mike Bush is here, CEO of Savvy Aviation, and we are going to talk about aircraft ignition systems. Now, before we get started, a few notes as we always have here. Uh, tonight's broadcast will be recorded and will be available on Social Flight's YouTube channel. Just search for Social Flight, one word on YouTube, that should bring you to our channel. In addition to that, be sure that you are registered and check out socialflight.com and the free Social Flight mobile apps. We have tens of thousands of aviation events and destinations, so many cool things going on, and we are currently having a contest where we're giving away a prize pack from Tempest. And so be sure to check that out. It's simple. All you have to do is get the app, fly anywhere, and you are entered to win as long as you check in on the app. It's so, so cool. And we have so many great prizes. We are just doing everything that we can to support general aviation and all of you, especially now during the crisis. And that is why we created the show of Social Flight Live to help bring some bright spots, education, and put together all of these things that you can do from the comfort of your own home until you can uh, spend a little bit more time out there socializing with others in person. And uh, so with that, I uh, would like to bring in uh, Mike Bush, um, you know, Mike is arguably the best known AMP and IA in general aviation. He founded Savvy Aviation in 2008 to provide aircraft maintenance, management, and consulting services to thousands of aircraft owners, including pre-buy management, innovative engine monitor analysis, and 24-7 breakdown assistance, which is essentially AAA for general aviation. He's authored hundreds of articles and four books on aircraft ownership and maintenance. I can tell you that myself and both of my sons have read these. We absolutely love your work. Welcome, Mike. How are you doing? Great, Jeff. Doing good. Excellent. Thanks so much uh, for joining us. So, um, yeah. So, you know, it's interesting because uh, it's very timely now. It looks like uh, we're cutting the, your head off just a little bit there in the camera. You might want to uh, lean back. Um, and, uh, you know, it's very timely because uh, there's obviously uh, a lot going on in the world of ignition systems, and we get a lot of, uh, I certainly, and I know you, get a lot of questions from uh, aircraft owners out there about what's going on with their aircraft and, and things that they can do. Um, and I know you've had a, you had a great article recently in AOPA. Let's, let's start at the kind of like the, the beginning. Um, and, and talk about where it all starts at the accessory case where the engine begins to turn uh, electricity into what can actually uh, cause that spark in the cylinder, uh, that magneto. Uh, tell me a little bit about what, what you've seen and, and some of the issues in, with the magnetos. Oh, well, there were lots, lots of issues with magnetos. Where do you want to start? Um, <laughs> they, they, Let's they, start simple um, before we get to complex things like I mean, I mean, and everything I, else. I, Actually, I ask you, where do you want to start? Uh, w one of the issues that we see a lot are people who have a hard time starting their engines. And, and hard starting is almost always an ignition problem. Mm. Um, and, you know, part of the problem is that um, uh, magnetos uh, don't generate very much voltage when they're turning uh, at, at starting RPM. Um, yep. And so, you know, if if the spark plug gaps are large, for example, that may not be a problem when the engine is running at at, at cruise RPM, but it might very well be a problem when you're trying to uh, to start. Um, I don't know. Do you, do you want well, to talk a little, let's, a little let's, bit about the about the the starting yeah, the starting let's, issues let's, with magnetos? Let's because. start with the first thing, right? If you're looking at magnetos and you're talking about the starting process, it's funny, I, we were just talking uh, just before we went live here and I was explaining how with uh, uh, my son Jake going for his AMP license now, we're, we're doing a little magneto camp here at, at home getting him ready for his test. And so I just happened to have one right here and it all starts with uh, this guy on front, the impulse coupling. So when you talk right. about starting magnetos, um, let's start by talking about this guy, which can cause uh, what its function is and how it can cause, uh, when it works well, how it can help start an engine, and when it works poorly, how it can not do that. <laughs> okay, well, of course, not 
uh, not all uh, aircraft use impulse couplings. Uh, that's sure. that's that's one of, of of two different starting systems that are used. Uh, the reason that starting um, with a magneto ignition system presents two problems. W one problem is that the voltage that a magneto puts out is uh, varies with its RPM. And when you're cranking an engine with a starter and it's turning 50 RPM, the magneto isn't gonna be generating enough voltage to fire a spark. The, the second problem is that magnetos are, are fixed time and, and we time them to the engine normally somewhere between 20 and 28 degrees before top dead center, depending on, uh, on, on what engine is involved. Um, and if you fire a spark at 20 to 28 degrees before top, top dead center when you're trying to start the engine, the engine's not going to start. It's just going to kick back because mm -hmm. the, spark, the spark is happening early. And it needs to happen early when the engine is, is running at normal RPM. But if, it's, if it fires that early when you're trying to start, uh, the engine will just kick back and it, it'll, it'll never start. So we have two problems. One is how do we get enough voltage out of magneto? And the second problem is how do we get the timing appropriate for starting? And, and the timing should be pretty close to right at top dead center when we're trying to start the engine. Um, there, there are basically two systems for doing that um, presently in use. And the one is the impulse coupling that you, that you were talking about. So let, that's, a, that's a mechanical solution to both of these problems. And the other solution, which is called a shower of spark system or a retard breaker magneto system, is more of a, a electronic uh, solution to the problem. But we'll talk about impulse couplings first. And if if your airplane uh, makes clicks when you turn over the prop or when the engine is uh, is stopping and you hear a click, 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 that means you have impulse couplings. Um, so, for example, most Cessnas, uh, most single engine Cessnas have impulse couplings. A lot of Bonanzas use shower of sparks. Mm -hmm. most, of, most of the twin Cessnas, like the one I fly, use shower of sparks. So, uh, again, if the, if, if the engine goes click, click, click when you turn the prop, it's, uh, you, you've got impulse couplings. Yeah. So the way, the way those things work, it, it's, it's, it's really kind of a clever mechanical solution to both of these problems. Um, the impulse coupling has a, a, um, an outer casing that is driven by, by the engine, by the, the, the accessory, uh, gears in the engine. Um, and it's got a, um, uh, an assembly that has fly weights on it. Uh, and, and that is hooked to the drive shaft of the magneto. So when the engine is, is being started, what happens, I don't know if you can demonstrate it with your little... I can actually, I can actually show you that. Prop. I'm going to point out to everyone right now, this is safe. This is a magneto that's not taken apart. You do not want to do this. Yeah. I'm hoping Jeff gets a jolt while he's doing this. It'll be pretty on camera. But anyway, you do not I, want to do this on a live magneto I've, and I've, send yourself flying. I've, I've certainly gotten a jolt, so I know it, I know it works. So um, yeah, this is this is the business end here, and I'll take it off and show everyone. Right. So, so what 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 happens is the, the those fly weights um, will contact a stop pin as you as as the engine tries to turn the magneto. Right. So if I bring and, this across. And, and so it's winding up a, a spring in there. And then when it gets to a certain point, it's about 25 degrees of rotation, those little ears on the on the outer housing uh, contact the fly weights and pull them off that stop pin. And the wound up spring uh, turns the magneto a whole lot faster than the engine cranking speed, fast enough that it'll generate a spark. And you know that happens basically twice per revolution of the of the magneto uh, shaft. So what that's doing, first of all, by by winding up the spring, it's delaying the spark by about 25 degrees, which is exactly what we want. And and then when the spring 
let's go. It's it's snapping the magneto at much higher RPM than what the engine is turning. Right, and I'll which, show that which, one more time. Which allows the magneto to generate enough voltage uh, to fire a spark plug. Now, one, once the engine starts, and this assembly starts rotating pretty rapidly, uh, centrifugal force pulls the fly weights away from the stop pin, and so everything rotates smoothly. And so that's when th these go out right here and pull these little tabs in so it right. can just go around. Correct. And and that's that centrifugal force does that. So it, it is it's a pretty clever arrangement. Um there have been a lot of problems with with impulse couplings, and there are ADs against uh, almost all impulse couplings requiring recurrent inspection. Um, the, the, it used to be that, mag, that that impulse couplings had little snap rings that held the the fly weight onto the onto the assembly, and, and they had a habit of coming off and dropping parts into the engine, and which was wasn't very good. Um, so I think now they rivet them all, um, yep. so they can't come apart, but, uh, These rivets right here. Right. But there is, uh, there are recurring inspections on all of these things. And at, at the very least, um, they have to be carefully inspected at the 500 hour magneto, um, um, inspection, uh, disassembly inspection interval, um, because th they wear and eventually they need to be replaced. Mm -hmm. um, so that's one of the two ways that we start engines with magneto ignition. And, and by the way, it's sort of interesting, but um, some engines that have impulse couplings have impulse couplings on both magnetos, mm. and some only have it on one magneto. A lot of pipers only have it on one magneto, so you so uh, so for starting purposes, you're you're only using one magneto. Um, I think Grumman's yeah. did that too. I think when you yeah. go to the start with your key, you're actually dis disabling one of the magnetos at that point, the one without yeah. the impulse coupling. Yeah. So I don't know why they, what, what they're trying to save a little weight or something like that. But <laughs> it, money. It, it, it's all money. <laughs> it, does, it, it does seem to me that having two would be is is better because you, you've got some redundancy, more likely that you're going to get a. Uh, a reliable start if you have two of them, but s some mm -hmm. engines are equipped with two, and some are, are equipped with only one mag that has an impulse coupling. So anyway, the other system uh, for starting, uh, which is the one that actually I have in my uh, Cessna 310, and it's often used in in bonanzas and stuff, is is the shower of spark system, which is, um, and the way that works is. Um, the left magneto has two sets of breaker points in it. One with the, that that opens at the normal timing of you know twenty something degrees before top dead center, and a second set of points that opens about top dead center and is used only for starting. So that's how they solve the ignition retarding problem: is to put this separate set of points. And it's only in the left mag. Mm. And, and it's the set of points that's used while you when you're cranking the engine, and then once you um, release the key from the start position or release the start button, in the case of a twin, uh, it 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 disconnects that retard set of points and starts using the regular set of points. Now uh, that's so that, solved, that, that solves, solves the timing. retard problem. So the other problem is how 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 do we get the mag to to generate enough voltage. And what, what the shower of spark system uses is it is it actually uses aircraft battery power. Um, and it and it feeds the aircraft battery through a, um, a starting vibrator, which is basically like a doorbell buzzer. It's an expensive doorbell buzzer, <laughs> uh, which which chops the, the battery power up into into pulses, into basically a square wave. And then it feeds those pulses uh, to uh, through the the retard breaker points, um, and that's what energizes the magneto coil, as opposed to the magneto actually generating it by itself. Magneto is not turning fast enough to generate enough voltage, but if we put this 
pulsed battery voltage in, um, th then it will generate a nice spark. And the reason they call it shower of sparks is because uh, during each ignition event while we're starting, instead of just a single spark, there's a whole train of sparks, you know, like a dozen of them that, that, that happen during the period of time that the, uh, that the points are open, that the retard points are open. So it, it, it does provide very good starting performance. Um, the main disadvantage of the shower of spark system is that because it requires battery power, if you've got a, a, a dead battery, you're not going to be able to hand prop the, the airplane because mm. you need battery power for, for starting. Um, then there's, there's kind of a variant on the shower sparks thing that, that came out sometime in the 90s. I forget exactly when, but um, yeah. Slick, Slick came out with this thing called Slick Start, which they call a magneto booster. And it's STC'd. Uh, and it, it it's STC to work with with both slick mags and Bendix mags, or I think there's two different part numbers for the for the box. And it's kind of like shower of sparks, except instead of using the a mechanical doorbell buzzer, it it's a solid state thing, uh, and it generates um, a, a train of of high voltage or not high voltage, but but enhanced voltage uh, pulses. That are fed into the magneto through the p lead. Hmm. Um, if you if if the airplane uses impulse couplings, it still uses the impulse coupling to retard the spark. If your airplane has shower of sparks, uh, then then it uses the retard breaker. But but it, you can get slick start for almost any uh, magneto um, ignition engine except for the 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 dreaded uh, dual mag. I, I don't think it's. I don't not think Slick Start is approved for the dual mag. I'm pretty sure. Uh, and we'll probably be talking about the dual mag <laughs> before yeah, we'll this get to that. <laughs> is over. But but uh, not not. It wasn't. Uh, it 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 wasn't. And uh, the, the, the uh, Lycoming's best engineering idea to 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 get that thing. But at any rate. Yeah, you know, it, it's interesting. So as you mentioned, the slick start system can be added to almost any system and it doesn't interfere with its design. Like you still right. use that right. impulse coupling. It's, it's, it's a pretty simple STC to, to install. And so if people are, have, you know, persistent starting problems, uh, but particularly if they live where it's cold and starting is difficult, uh, adding a, a slick start is, is not a bad idea. And it's it's STC, like I say, for just about anything except uh, Lycoming engines that use the the dual mag. If your Lycoming engine has a D at the end of its number, then then you're out of luck <laughs> in several different ways. <laughs> how do you how do you when you're talking with a client uh, or, or giving advice to someone? How, how do you differentiate between when you're adding, when you're recommending a slick start or, or agreeing with them that a slick start's a good move um, for their aircraft for, for normal operations versus whether it's actually masking a problem where they should be able to start fine on any way. Yeah, I mean, we normally don't don't recommend a, a slick start as as the first line remedy. Um, we 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 want to. We want to get the, the the system working the way it was supposed to work, um, but I'm I'm just I'm, I'm just saying that that um, if if you have a situation where starting is is difficult, particularly if you're if you're in in really cold weather, hmm. um, a slick start is not bad because it 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 gives you a hotter starting spark than than any of the standard systems. Yeah. So let's move through the rest of the mag a little bit. You know, um, you are famously a a non-interventionalist uh, in, in, unless uh, there's a problem with an aircraft or an engine or something that needs to go in there. Yeah. Uh, you know, don't disturb something to cause trouble. How how do magnetos, in particular, as an accessory, fall in 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 your view of when you uh, of the type of component and when you really should be opening things up to see how things are going instead of waiting for uh, a failure or vice versa. Yeah, that that's that's a, a pretty interesting subject. 
Um, you're right. I'm I'm a, a strong proponent of reliability-centered maintenance, which basically one of the basic tenets of reliability-centered maintenance is um, we we don't um, uh, want to do any more maintenance than is necessary because doing maintenance, uh, you know, sometimes breaks things, and so we we really don't want to take stuff apart if it's working properly, mm -hmm. and you know, one of the tenets is is when you're trying to decide what your maintenance program is, it's it's kind of a, what's the worst thing that could happen if this fails, and and if the answer to what's the worst thing that could happen if this fails is you know it's okay, it just costs some money to fix it, then typically we we don't want to do preventive maintenance. We just want to run things to failure. If the failure could compromise safety or the failure could get you stuck somewhere you don't want to be, then it's worth doing preventive maintenance. So at first blush, I mean, let me change the subject for a moment. Um, I have dual vacuum pumps on my twin. The manufacturers of vacuum pumps say that they, they, they should be retired at, at 500 hours. I think that's crazy because, um, all the, all the systems in my airplane that need vacuum pumps will run fine on one pump. So mm -hmm. the failure of one pump in my airplane, because I have dual pumps, is an acceptable failure. And so I run them to failure. I, I never change vacuum pumps, you know, uh, on a, on a uh, precautionary basis. I, I just run them till they fail. I, and I always keep a spare in the wing locker, so <laughs> it's easy to put put a new one on. Um, but I, I sort of come to the conclusion that that sort of thinking really doesn't or shouldn't apply to magnetos. I mean, at first blush, you look at a magneto and you say, look, the engine will run fine on one magneto. So the failure of a magneto shouldn't be a, a, a safety related problem. And, and therefore, we ought to just run magnetos to failure. And the problem with that is, and the reason that I've sort of uh, modified my thinking on that to be a little bit different from the vacuum pump situation, is that um, I've found that pilots uh, do a very, very bad job of reacting to magneto failures. And well, let, let's just talk a little bit about, about how magnetos fail. Magnetos can fail nicely or they can f fail nastily. <laughs> a nice magneto failure is when the magneto just rolls over and, and goes dead um, and just stops producing a spark. And if you have that kind of magneto failure, chances are you won't even notice it unless you happen to be looking at your engine monitor and notice that the EGTs are 50 or 100 degrees higher than what you're used to. But the engine will keep running just fine, and and you 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 probably not even notice that kind of failure. The nasty failures are the ones you really notice. The nasty failures are when the mag starts; it doesn't stop producing a spark. It just starts firing spark plugs at the wrong time, and that kind of failure is um, due to typically teeth breaking off of the distributor gear in the magneto. Magnetos are full of these plastic parts. That they have to be plastic so because they can't conduct electricity. And there's this very critical gear called the distributor gear, which, which we're looking at right now, um, that uh, is, is the thing that, that sends the spark to the right spark plug at the right time. It's got a little a little finger, conductive finger in there. Um, and as it rotates, and it, and it rotates at, at half crankshaft speed, uh, that finger comes in close proximity to one of, in this case, the four contacts in the in the dis, in, in the uh, distributor block. Um, this is this is a magneto, obviously, out of a four-cylinder engine. If it was a six-cylinder engine, there'd, there'd be six contacts there. The finger actually doesn't touch the contact. It just comes really close and, and close enough that the spark jumps across it. It's called a jump gap. 
distributor. Um, but and the problem is if if that gear, that plastic gear, um, loses a tooth or two, which which happens from I've got tons of pictures of failed distributor gear. So this happens That's a lot. <laughs> yeah. Then th then that gear will 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 turn erratically. It will get out of sync. It will it it, it won't fire the spark plugs the right spark plug at the right time. And the engine can go berserk when that happens. It, I mean, it can go change of underwear berserk. Now, that shouldn't be a big problem because if the, the, the pilot had the presence of mind to, to fault isolate it and turn off the bad magneto and just run on the good magneto, the engine would run fine. But in all of the years that I've been watching this, I have never seen a pilot do that. Uh, I've, I've seen these failures happen to low time pilots, high time pilots, flight instructors. I've seen them happen in the pattern. I've seen them happen up at the flight levels. Um, there, there was one, there was one, one of my clients who was, who was uh, flying a Cirrus, a turbocharged Cirrus was, you know, up at up at flight level two one zero with an oxygen tube up his nose and had one of his magnetos go berserk, and it literally took him thirty minutes to get the airplane on the ground. And and during that entire thirty minutes, it never occurred to him to to switch to one mag and then to the other and see if he could, you know, get the get the engine to run smoothly, which he would have been able to do. He he treated it as an emergency. Um, you know, I can kind of see it if, if it happens in the pattern that you'd have to treat it as an emergency because you, you don't have time to troubleshoot anything. You, you've got to concentrate on flying the airplane. But, but this guy had a half an hour <laughs> to get down. Wow. He, was up, he was up at flight level 210. It, it takes a while to get down. He landed at Cincinnati Lunkin Field, as I recall. Um, and it, it during that half an hour, it never occurred to him to try to fault isolate which magneto was was bad so that he could turn it off. So I sort of concluded that that, that kind of magneto failure isn't like losing a vacuum pump. It should be if, if you know pilots were properly trained, it should be, but but just in, in fact, it doesn't seem to work out that way. Pilots hmm. just just when, when the engine goes berserk, they kind of freak out, treat it as emergency. And so I sort of decided, you know, I guess we can't let distributor gears fail. We got to do preventive maintenance on them. And the the uh, the manufacturers, both both uh, uh, slick mags um, and uh, and Bendix mags, um, are uh, they 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 call for a 500 hour um, IRAN uh, teardown inspection. You don't have to overhaul them. Um, overhaul does a lot more stuff than what the 500 hour does. So you normally just ask for a 500 hour IRAN on the mags. Some mechanics will do it themselves. I used to do my own mags. I've got four mags on the airplane and I used to be able to go through the four mags in about three hours of work. Um, but now I'm sort of getting lazy and I send them out to a, to a mag shop because they, they have better test equipment and so on they can do a better job than i can do so i just send them out mm. um, but i i am pretty religious about doing 500 hundred dollar magneto inspections there, there's just there, there's a there are consumables let's call them in in the mag there's like there's a, um, uh, a carbon brush uh that 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 wears there are, are little felts that get dry that have to be lubricated um, That's the carbon brush for anyone interested. Yeah, you, there, you know, you need to put some lube on the on the cam. Um, you need to check the internal timing, which tends to drift as the as the points wear. Um, to to the internal timing is called the E gap. It's kind of a weird name, but there, there's uh, some timing internal to the mag. This is different than timing the mag to the engine. That, that has to be done properly for the mag to be able to generate the, its, its rated uh, volta voltage. And so I'm, I'm a pretty strong believer in, in, in going through the mags like that 
um, every 500 hours. Mags are unfortunately kind of a black box. You know, we we don't have a good way to determine their condition without taking them apart. If we did, I wouldn't want to take them apart. We, we can't we can't borescope a mag. We mm -hmm. can't check the oil filter on a mag. We can't, you know, do any of the kinds of, can't do a compression check on a mag. There's, we can't do any of the sort of things that, that we can do with, with engines uh, where, where we can do a pretty good job of determining condition without taking anything apart. But in the case of the mag, it's, it's just kind of a black box. And, and yeah. th there's a lot of stuff in there that can break or wear out. Um, it, it is... You know, if you ever look at an exploded parts diagram of Magneto, it's kind of frightening how many parts are in it. Um, and uh, so I, I'm a pretty strong believer in, in, in doing 500 hour uh, mag disassembly inspections. For the and most uh, critical type of failure that you were talking about, do you find that you can usually uh, find a problem with those nylon gears before they fracture? Or is it just the fact that they get replaced often as part of an inspection that keeps you safe? Um, they they basically before they fail they they tend to kind of change color and stuff. Um, um, so you can kind of look at them and and tell whether they whether they look. The, the, like the one you had looks pretty good. It's it, that mm -hmm. that's that's the color they ought to be. Yeah, of course it is because it's on a non-airworthy mag meant for inspection, uh, and so since they can't sell me on one, I'm sure that uh, it's uh, I'm sure that's quite good. <laughs> where where did that thing come from? <laughs> oh, it's all part of the uh, all part of the teaching tools. <laughs> oh, very good, very good. Well, at any rate, th those gears are are vulnerable, and and th there's a lot of lubrication points in the mags. Yep. And again, there's another nylon one with. right here as well that it meshes with. Right. Right. Or um, to be more accurate, like that. Um, also, um, uh, there are circumstances, particularly with with turbocharged airplanes, where where you can develop um, misfire, where where the spark instead of uh, jumping across the spark plug electrodes winds up arcing inside the magneto distributor cap, and um, uh, I've seen particularly um, uh, slick mags. Uh, I've, I've seen mags that got very seriously damaged by high altitude misfire and had components melted inside and stuff. It was, it was pretty uh, pretty ugly. Um, the um, it is. It's kind of interesting that in order to get a slick mag is a is a small, physically small magneto, and there aren't mm -hmm. big. You know, there's not a lot of social distancing inside of a slick magneto, <laughs> and and um, so if you if if you want to be able to fly up at high altitude with a slick magneto, they 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 typically pressurize them. Right. And, and one of the interesting things that I've it's all it's always been a head scratcher to me, but the way they pressurize those mags is to is to run a, a line from the turbocharger output upper deck air uh, through a filter, a little plastic filter, and then they split it into two and they run two lines to the the two magnetos to pressurize them. So this this little plastic filter is a single point failure, and and if if you know if one of the nipples breaks off the little filter, which I've seen happen at high altitude takes out both mags simultaneously so yep. it, it sort of defeats the the you know the fa requirement for having um uh, complete redundancy absolutely and, and, to, know, some, and to some extent the the bendix dual mag you don't have to have one of those you can show right uh no <laughs> okay but the the, the bendix dual mag also there, it's got some single point failure modes that'll take out both both mags right. Like, Although you know, I will say I I have found it, it interesting that the the Bendix mag as a whole, the, it, although it's larger and heavier as a magneto, that size gives you that extra gap that you don't have to pressurize, as you mentioned, and um, it's in, in some ways a little beefier. Right? Yeah, you know, it, kinda, uh, it, it it depends on the magneto. There, there's there's basically four 
families of magnetos that we see on these engines. There, are, There's the slick um, 4,000 or 6,000 series, which are the small slick mags. Yeah, um, that's what that was. And, and they definitely have to be pressurized to operate up at high altitude because they're small. There's the Bendix, the smaller Bendix mags, which are called S20s or S200s, depending on if they're a retard breaker or impulse coupling. And they're kind of medium sized mags. Mm -hmm. And then and then the ones that you're talking about and the ones that are by far the best mags in the business and the, the ones that are on my airplane are the Bendix S1200s, which are big, yes. gigantic tractor mags. Massive. <laughs> and, and those things can go up to really high altitude without having to be pressurized just because of the large uh, size of them. And, and yeah. they throw a really hot spark and so on. So if, 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 you, if, if you're choosing mags, the S1200s are, are the best in the business. The, the problem is there are uh, some engines that, that, that you can't physically fit them on because they're so big. Uh, for example, the Continental engines, that the cross-flow engines that have a top induction system, um, there's just not enough room to, to get an S1200 installed on those engines because the induction system gets in the way. Yep. So they either have to run with slicks or, or Bendix S, S20s, but they can't yep. run with the big giant mags. So those are that's those are three families. And then the fourth family is is the dual mag, the the the, the, the D3000. The uh, disaster. Dual, dual mag, <laughs> which unfortunately, besides being a, a, a bad piece of design, is um, the, the the mags. The dual mag is, was, was made by Bendix. It's owned by Continental. And it's only used on Lycoming engines. What's wrong with this picture, right? <laughs> so, so Continental, you know, about five years ago said, wait a minute. You know, we're making these dual mags. They're only going on our competitors' engines. I don't think we're going to support them anymore. So they announced they weren't going to support dual mags anymore, which didn't affect any Continental uh, uh, owners only affected light combing owners. So now to keep those those dual mags alive, the light combing owners are dependent on on aftermarket you know parts and stuff like that. And if you crack the case, you're just out of luck on on those things. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, they're a bit of, they're a little bit of a mess. Yeah, they are. And, um, and the, most the most of the engines that use them, uh, I mentioned before that. If if you have a D at the end of your thing, like a like a, a TIO 540 J2BD, the D at the end means it uses the dual mag. And most Lycoming engines that use the dual mag can be converted to use two conventional mags, but it requires putting a different accessory case on the engine. Uh, so it's a it's a big deal. It's not something. That, it's something you basically have to take the engine out of the airplane, and send it off to an engine shop to, to, to modify. Yeah. So it's the kind of thing you'd want to maybe do at overhaul time, but not yeah. something that you would do any other time because it's a big deal, unfortunately. You, you know, the other thing I saw not too long ago, which I think is important to mention, and this happened also on one of the, the slick mags, one of the smaller mags, uh, is if you if you allow a spark plug to uh, uh, to to go too long and to to develop an internal resistance that's way too high, which I know Tempest, uh, strong supporter of ours, is a huge huge uh, advocate for. Keep track of what the resistance values are of your of your plugs and make sure they don't you don't have one that's skyrocketing in mm -hmm. internal resistance. I've actually seen that. Uh, fry the the inside of the uh, distributor. Oh yes, um, we 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 saw that a lot on on Cirruses when they 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 were using um, the slick mags, um, and we 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 would see a lot of cases where where there was crossfire inside of the magnetos. We don't see that as much now. They don't use slicks anymore. They use uh, they use Bendix mags, which are a little bit bigger. Not the big giant Bendix mags, but the but the S two hundreds. And we don't see that as much anymore, um, but that can happen uh, not necessarily with a high plug resistance. It can even happen if just the the spark plug gaps are allowed to get too large. Yeah, yeah. If, well, anything if, that causes if, if, that, that resistance, right? Right. The 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 spark is going to jump the path of least resistance, and hopefully that 
path least resistance is across the spark plug electrodes, but sometimes <laughs> it's not, and then bad things happen. Yeah, so very, very important message to everyone that, you know, when you look at a, an, an aircraft and you look at systems within it, you, you want to be doing your best to maintain the least expensive component in the chain so that it doesn't damage the more expensive components, and spark plug yeah. is an important one. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Um, so, Mike, tell I, me a little bit about uh, those mag checks because we get a lot, we've got certainly got a lot of questions coming in. You mentioned doing that. Let's be a little more specific with people. If you encounter a rough running engine and it's not, you know, fuel based, um, what are the steps to, I know it seems simple, but people are asking, what are the steps to isolate the magneto and, uh, and return yourself back to a, a, a safe location? Oh, uh, you, you you're saying if 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 you're in flight and 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 you have a what what engine, should these pilots have done that you're referring to? Well, basically, they should um, if you have time, obviously it, it it's situ situational. But if you have time to do some troubleshooting, uh, the the logic should be well, maybe it's a bad magneto. Let's see which magneto it is or if it is one so that basically means you would go to say the left mag and and see if the engine smooths out one of two things is going to happen it's either going to smooth out or it's it's going to quit um and either way it, it'll tell you which magneto is is the 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 bad magneto um but try Try running the engine on each magneto individually, and if one of and if it runs better on one magneto than it does on both, then leave it on one magneto and then troubleshoot it when you get on the ground. Um, the, it, the there's one one thing I'll mention, and this this sort of comes up with um, the question of in-flight mag kicks too. If you're if you're messing with the mag switches in flight. And you, and you do something that causes the engine to quit. Um, the impulse is to, to to undo what you just did and go back to both, um, and, and that can cause a, a a pretty loud bang and after fire, because if the engine quits and the prop is windmilling, um, it quits because the ignition went away. It's it's still going to be pumping fuel air mixture through the cylinders. It's just nothing's going to be lighting them off. So the exhaust is going to be all full of fuel air mixture because it was it came in, in the intake valve, went out the exhaust valve, nothing ignited it in, in the cylinders. And so then if you turn the ignition back on and the engine starts running again, it's going to ignite all that fuel air mixture that's sitting in the exhaust and make a big bang. And normally it doesn't hurt anything, but it usually scares the heck out of the pilot. So the the if if the engine quits while you're messing with the ignition system the the right thing to do is to pull a mixture which Im will immediately clear out all the fuel and air from everything then turn the ignition on then push the mixture control back in and the engine will relight and you won't get a bang um uh, there's a lot of you know i'm a big advocate of doing in-flight mag checks because it's by far the best test you can do of your ignition system the, the the mag check that we do on the ground before takeoff is kind of a bad joke. Um, it, it it'll only show up the grossest problems with with ignition system because we're running it on the ground at, at very low power and at typically at a very rich mixture, so it's very easy to ignite and even a wimpy spark is going to ignite it just fine we won't see a problem um, so the best way to test your ignition system and i try to do this every couple of flights just routinely is um is to do an in-flight mag check um at you know relatively high cruise power and at, at the leanest mixture you can stand if you're a lean a peak guy like i am do it lean a peak because the higher the power and the leaner the mixture the harder it is to ignite. So if you want to really determine the health of your ignition system, what, what you want to do is do a, a, a mag check under under stress, if you will. Mm -hmm. And, and the, the most stressful situation, the hardest thing uh, for the, the for the spark to ignite is is 
a, a high pressure, very lean mixture. Hmm. So we, we at, ask our- At lower, like you mentioned high power. Uh, I know your flight profile talks about 65% power, but can you do it at higher power settings also? Yeah, the 65% thing actually applies to, to the GAMI lean test. It really doesn't apply to the, to okay. the, um, to the mag check. There's no, no limitation on power that you can use for the mag check. But, um, you know, d doing it, doing it at normal cruise altitude, it, it, um, if, if it's a normally aspirated airplane, it, you know, optimally it'll be, you know, 5,000 feet or something like that. Where you can right. where you can get at least seventy five percent power. Um, if it's a turbocharged airplane, it doesn't matter. You can do it up high. Turbocharged right. airplanes always think they're at sea level, <laughs> regardless of where you are. Um, but at any rate, we 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 like to do the the mag check under those conditions because it's a it's it's much much more demanding, and right. it will it will tell us, you know, how well each spark plug is is doing. And um, what we like our clients to do is to do this, to, to, to switch to one mag and leave it there for at least 10 sample times on their engine monitor. Mm -hmm. So if their engine monitor is sampling once a second, th then you, you wanna run on the one mag for at least 10 seconds. So we, we, we get enough data to be able to really see what's going on. And then go back to both and then go to the other mag for 10 seconds. If the engine monitor is you know, sampling every two seconds, then you'd wanna do it for 20 seconds. If it's only sampling every six seconds, then you'd wanna do it for a whole minute. But yep. we, wanna, we wanna get at least 10 samples on the engine monitor so we can see uh, for each spark plug, whether the, the, you know, when you go to a single mag operation, the, the, the EGTs will rise but what we're really interested in seeing is, well, first of all, we, we want to make sure they all rise <laughs> and none of them fall. But we also want to see if they're if they're steady or if they're erratic. Right. If they're er erratic, it means that that spark plug is not igniting the mixture every time. It's igniting it some of the time, but it's failing to ignite it some of the time. And and you know that tells us that we're having a problem. Typically, it's with a spark plug. If, Yep. There, there so, aren't very many mag failure modes that won't affect all of the cylinders. Mm -hmm. So if, if you if you're having a problem that's uh, an ignition problem that's isolated to one cylinder, it's it's usually the spark plug. It could right. conceivably be the ignition lead, but it's usually the spark plug. If you're having a problem that affects all of the spark plugs, that then it might well be the magneto. We've got one here that uh, we did a test just to show everyone here and and uh, that actually identifies something. Um, and so here's an example. This is off my own aircraft that we went up and ran uh -huh. a, a flight profile on. And a couple interesting, so this is showing uh, first going to the left mag on both. We've got um, cylinders two, four, and six at the bottom, and one, three, and five at the, uh, uh, at the top in these two oh, graphs. Um, and one of the interesting things that this shows, of course, Mike, is that when going over to the right mag, and switching to that, number five here uh, became an outlier. And mm -hmm. so we know we've got a problem on number number five, which is unlikely to be Magneto. And I think we may have traced down to Harness. Yeah. But, um, but you know, what I found fascinating, and this, this, is, this is a really important, uh, 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 an honest pitch for savvy analysis, because I learned a ton working with your folks there, that you actually see the difference between the top and the bottom plugs when you do this because as you can see here when you're on the when you switch from left to right mag uh, the uh, you go one three and five get hotter um, uh, two four and six get colder and vice versa the other way around um, because you what the efficiency of seeing which plugs you're actually firing so th I found this to be a fascinating uh, kind of experience and test yeah, and 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 it does, you know, if if the spark if that spark plug were were bad, we would be seeing a, a kind of an erratic trace. But we're not. It's 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 pretty much as smooth as all the others. It just isn't rising nearly as much. So that makes it sound more likely that it's a harness or 
possibly a high resistance plug. Hmm. Um, yeah, it's it's interesting, but I I just want to encourage everyone out there, not just uh, of course to uh, you know to think about you know, savvy analysis and your services, but to be comfortable doing an in-flight mag check. Yes, that and it's it it's not gonna it, it, you know if if it does shake you out of your seat and and scare you when you make that when you do it, then it's a good thing you did it. <laughs> right, right. I mean, I I know some some people who you know, don't like to do it when their significant other is sitting in the right seat because then they, then they have to answer the question, what was that, you know? <laughs> but um, again, the worst that can happen uh, during a mag check, and it never does, but the worst that could happen is that you switch to one mag and the engine quits because you have a completely dead mag. Mm -hmm. And if, if that happens, again, it's it's very easy to rectify. Pull the mixture, go back to both, push in the mixture, you're back in business. Um, yeah. No 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 bangs, no nothing exciting. Just and and I've never I've never actually had anybody have that happen. It's just everybody says, oh my god, well what happens if the engine quits? So yes, yeah. There, and and by all means, a good answer to that you know, question, but it ain't gonna happen. Yeah, but except for the one thing that does happen, and that is be careful and don't change it all the way to off. If if you if you took your key oh, and for yeah. some reason weren't paying attention, turned it all the way to the off, please follow Mike's instructions and right. that, the wait, same thing, pull the mixture. Same thing <laughs> right. The same thing applies. If 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 you any any time you make the engine quit by taking away the ignition, you should pull the mixture, put the ignition back, and then push the mixture back in. Yeah. And that'll and by avoid the, way, the possibility of an after fire. And, and by the way, I'm going to bring this up one more time because we've got some questions that came in. This this analysis that you see is actually from the Savvy uh, Analysis website. So if people are asking how did we split it into two, how do we get this this graph? It's this is directly off of Savvy Aviation. Um, yeah, and so it's, it's 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 probably hard. Well, you can't really see it here, but th there's all those little buttons on the top mm -hmm. and the bottom that let you control. You can bold. A, a, a certain trace you can say I only want to see odd numbered cylinders I only want to see even numbered cylinders uh, um, and in this case you you said I only want to see odds on the top one I only want to see the evens on the bottom one or, or vice versa and that's that's how you got that that neat display but it's a very very versatile system and it'll let you choose between one two and four graphs uh, and and map exactly what parameters you you want to see if you if you yeah. wanted to turn on, you know, fuel flow or something on on that graph, you can you can superimpose fuel flow or any any other parameter that your engine monitor is. Yeah. Capturing. So so for those people out there that have invested in an engine monitor that have their data, you might as well like the investment and also be able to see the data using really good tools. I know there are tools obviously available from JPI and EI, et cetera, that let you look at your data, but I haven't found one that's quite as good as the one that you can see from Savvy. And then when you have an issue, you can uh, get you can get right to the experts and get some analysis and some answers on that. So, right. and, then, um, and then one of the nice uh, parts of this is it, this is completely web-based. You can run it from any, any, de any device that has a, a standard browser on it. So, for example, if you get the JPI software, it, it doesn't run on a Mac. It only runs on a PC. And with, with, with Savvy Analysis, uh, you can do this on an iPad. You can do it on anything you want to do it on, as long as it has a browser. Mm. And also, it, uh, it, this, will, this system knows how to decode the data from literally every kind of engine monitor that's built, both uh, certi cer certified ones like you know JPI or Garmin or anything like that, uh, or um, uh, experimental ones, Dynon, and um, so pretty much any kind of engine monitor that that can record data, uh, you can upload to this system, and it's free, by the way. <laughs> well, you so can't beat that. That, 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 that. The price is right. <laughs> yeah. So Mike, we've talked a lot about the mechanical systems uh, having to do with uh, uh, the ignition systems. Um, let's talk for a minute about electronic ignition systems that are available on the market. Um, what your experience is with that and what you'd like to see in the future? Well, um, you know, I, I, anytime I talk about the ignition systems, I always 
you know, talk about what a head scratcher it is that that we're still using this ancient mechanical system for ignition. You know, this is the 21st century for Pete's sake. Uh, magnetos, magnetos were do, actually developed in the 1890s, and uh, they were used on cars up to till about the 1920s, and then they stopped using them on cars. And they went to you know battery powered. Uh, ignition systems um, but we're still using them on airplanes and um, well I'll take that back um, almost nobody flying experimental airplanes uses magnetos anymore they're, they're all using uh, electronic ignition systems because they're so much better um, for certificated aircraft there are two STC electronic ignition system retrofits uh, and they're both quite good uh, uh, electro air um, came out with theirs oh i don't know five or six years ago i think and uh, the uh, uh, the surefly uh, system came out more recently and they're both direct retrofits for for magnetos um, and they both work pretty well. We, you know, we had a few problems early on with the electro air, with their their um, uh, variable timing feature. They got they they fixed the software, and that that went away. And we had a little problem initially with the Surefly systems, where the mags, the, the electronic mags, would occasionally shut down. Um, and they figured out why they were doing that, and they fixed that in the software. So um, at the moment, both of them are, are really good systems. The bad part is that the FAA has only been willing to approve an STC to replace one of the two magnetos. You can't replace both magnetos. Um, you know, I have a hard time understanding the logic. The, the, the FAA's logic is that apparently that they think it's more likely to have a total electrical failure than it is to have a magneto come apart and i don't quite i don't quite get that especially nowadays when you know so many airplanes have dual ignition their dual electrical systems and dual batteries and dual alternators and stuff um and and i think it's partly that the you know airplane the airplanes we fly are are, are certificated under uh, part 23 and the FAA you know recently totally overhauled part 23 and sort of brought it kicking and screaming into the 21st century um, but engine stuff was certificated under part 33 which hasn't changed you know since World War II it's a very very regressive um, set of certification regs and um, and it really needs to to, to to get an overhaul the way part 23 was i think but in any case the 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 faa has has not been willing to allow either electro air or um sure flight sure flight to uh to retrofit both both magnetos you only retrofit one magneto with the electronic system and the other magneto has to stay being a tractor mag and both yeah, of those systems, change. both of those systems use have variable timing, um, with, so that in cruise um, it, it advances the timing considerably, and it provides you know pretty good fuel savings and stuff. Um, but since it only it only advances the timing on the one spark plug. Basically, the spark plug that's hooked to the mag is just going along for the ride. You know, it's it's really not participating. By the time the the mag fires its spark, most of you know most of the combustion events are already over. So um, yeah. it's it, it's too bad, and I, and I hope that the FAA gets a little bit you know more relaxed about this stuff because dual mags or or dual EISs are definitely the way to go. There's yeah, actually a there's actually a system that a lot of the experimentalists use called uh, called an EMAG, which which is actually self exciting. It's got a little generator inside of it, and it doesn't even need the aircraft electrical system to work. Um, but those guys apparently don't have any interest in, in in getting an STC for their 
for their product. And they don't uh, want to spend their entire life savings trying to get through the FAA. Yeah, it's just that, you know the FAA unfortunately is a huge flywheel that 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 makes it very hard uh, to innovate, and that's particularly true in the power plant area. Uh, it's just extremely expensive to develop a new anything that has to do with engines. You know, it's interesting. I think the only system I, I've ever seen having to do with that, that the FAA approved that covered both mags was the LASAR system a, a while ago from Unison. And that was only because they were still mechanical mags that oh, had yeah. the addition of right. the electronics added to it to advance the timing. But if all the electronics failed, you still had mechanical mags. Mm -hmm. And th th that's not supported anymore, is it? I don't I mean, think I, it is. I, yeah, I think it, I think it, it it died a quiet death. Um, it was a tough sell. Yeah. And of course, uh, Slick got take bought out by by Champion. Yes. And and the Bendix got was acquired a long time ago by Continental. Yes. So. Th those are the folks that we're that we're dealing with nowadays. For, for well, all maybe someday we'll stuff. we'll see those. Uh, I, I but you're still recommending for the non-experimental folks that have to go with only one mag. Do you do you recommend that that uh, that people get the benefits at least at least take one of the mechanical mags out of the system and go I, I electronic? Think, yeah, uh, we've had we've had good experience with it, and um, I, I would not hesitate to recommend uh, putting either of those EISs on on the airplane. The only reason I don't have it on my airplane is because um, in, in one case, the, one of the systems is not certified for turbocharged airplanes, and the other one is sort of for, for certified for turbocharged airplanes, but you have to disable a variable timing feature for hmm. turbocharged airplanes, which, which, which does away with a lot of the advantage. Yeah. Um, so, so far, nobody's really come out with, a, with an EIS that, that works very well with turbocharged airplanes, which would, would be nice. I'm so I'm 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 waiting for that to happen. Okay, well for I those of us my airplane, but I would love to because I got I got four tractor mags and that's fair, a, a lot of maintenance. <laughs> <laughs> Makes a lot of sense. Yeah, absolutely. Well, Mike, thank you so much for taking your time this evening to join us and talk about uh, aircraft ignition systems. Uh, would love to have you back as always and uh, come up with another topic to talk about because there is. There is no end to uh, the interest and the need that's out there in general aviation. And, and from my experience, there is no end to your knowledge when it comes to all of this. So I like putting those two things together. There's no shortage of topics. We're not going to run out of things to talk about, Jeff, <laughs> no, I'm sure. So, of course, I would be delighted to, to come back. Excellent. Well, thank you. Thank you all so much. And thank all of you for taking the time out this evening to join us here on Social Flight Live. Be sure again to check out socialflight.com and the free Social Flight mobile apps. It'll let you know everything else that we've got coming up and all of the other programs that you can see. On Tuesday, February 9th, next Tuesday at 8 p.m., we have Backcountry Flying with the Recreational Aviation Foundation. We are then off for a week. And so you'll have to skip the week of February 16th, President's Week. And then we are back on the 23rd with Team Aeroshell. Um, and uh, we will be coming back the following that following week, our kickoff March with astronaut David Williams. And so we've got a lot more stuff coming up. And of course, we will have Mike Bush back. Mike, again, thank you so, so much. And I appreciate everything that you do for General Aviation. Well, thanks, Jeff. I'm 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 going to have to get get on on that aeroshell forum because I want to find out why I can't get my aeroshell in <laughs> in, in gallon jugs anymore. <laughs> You'll get it delivered in a T6 Texan. I think we can make that happen. <laughs> that would be great. <laughs> All right, everyone. Until next time, I'm Jeff Simon for Social Flight. Blue skies.